until January, and Terry Smith, one of our, our wrap-up speakers, will be succeeding me. Uh, I'd like to ask you first to turn off your cell phones or put them on sun. And uh, I'd like to thank today's registration volunteers, Carol Anderson and Paul Myrop, for helping us today. Paul told us of his big brothers here. Where's his big brother? Thanks, big brother, for, for coming to join us. Um, and uh, uh, Tar, thank you very much for coming to join us as well. Uh, today, Commonwealth North hosts a panel of experts on uh, to discuss food security in Alaska <coughs> and what it means in terms of public policy. Uh, food security uh, refers not only to ensuring access to affordable, nutritious food, but also to a resilient supply chain that can do, reliably deliver food to Alaskans, even in an emergency. Uh, those of you who know that I've done a lot of work in the Arctic, uh, food security is very important throughout our state. Uh, people who rely on subsistence foods, we look at new shipping in the Bering Strait in the Arctic Ocean as an example. We've got to make sure that uh, the whales, the walrus, the seals, uh, that people depend on for food there are, are maintained and sustained. And uh, for, the, for those of us who don't have 75% of our diet on something that we catch or, or hook or net, uh, it's got to be grown someplace. And uh, according to a report commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Services, 95% of the $2 billion of food Alaskans purchase each year is imported. Our food is shipped through long supply chains by airplane, barge, and truck from all over the world. Most of it comes in, Sharon, through the Port of Alaska. Is that right? Yes. And uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, these supply lines can be fragile, and they can be easily disrupted by natural disasters or world events. And our supply chains also have transportation costs, which increase prices on the shelves. This means that not only are we vulnerable to a disruption in food supply, but the vast majority of money we spend on food is sent out of state. Alaskans have always harvested food through subsistence hunting and gathering, and then small farms were operated by Russian, later American settlers and prospectors. Uh, large commercial agriculture, however, has not reached an economy of scale uh, large enough to be the primary food source for Alaskans. There have been a number of government programs to try to jumpstart Alaska agriculture. In 1935, colonists consisting of 203 families were relocated from the lower 48 to the Palmer area as part of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal to pull the U.S. out of the Great Depression. In the late 1970s, the state created a task force to enhance the agricultural industry in Alaska and designated state land in Delta Junction and other places for sale as farmland. And these efforts also sparked the Point McKenzie Dairy Project and construction of support facilities such as grain storage and meat processing plants. Today, only one dairy farm remains from the original colonial farms, and despite state efforts, Alaskans still get the overwhelming majority of their produce delivered from outside Alaska. Uh, today, our panel will discuss some of the challenges in Alaska's agriculture industry and some of the approaches the state and the private sector are taking to move toward a larger, economically sustainable agricultural sector. An economically sustainable agricultural industry would help keep more Alaskan dollars in the state economy mitigate against supply chain disruptions. It could be an economic engine by creating new jobs in both agriculture and its support industries. We anticipate that today's program will kick off a Commonwealth North series early next year to study food production and supply in Alaska, uh, to look at policies the state might adopt to enhance local food production, and also to look at whether the state has con adequate contingency plans in place in the event of a disruption of our food supply. And I'll, I'll say, I, I don't think we have any members of the new cabinet here uh, today, but uh, I'll tell you one of the first things the new cabinet will have to do to get together is uh, figure out what is the, uh, what are Alaska's contingency plans. And that's a very important uh, process. Uh, I'd like to invite you to sign up for Commonwealth North's email newsletter at commonwealthnorth.org to receive announcements about this program series over the next year. I'd also like now to invite members of Commonwealth North who are here to stand. I'd like to personally thank you for your membership and the tremendous work you've done to educate Alaskans, including our policy leaders on Alaska's public policy challenge, challenges. You may take a seat. 
those of you who were sitting, I'd like to invite the rest of you to join Commonwealth North, and now's a great time to, to, to join. Now, if you have questions for the panel today, please complete the yellow question cards on your table and hold them up for our staff to collect, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the program. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our head table. To my left is Ed Fogles, who is a partner in Jade North LLC and former Deputy Commissioner for the Alaska Department of uh, Natural Resources. Ed, I had the pleasure of serving serving with you and uh, was joking when you came in. I did, said, I didn't know you cared about agriculture. <laughs> but we're, we're going to let you uh, defend yourself uh, uh, appropriately there. Uh, to my far right is Joanna Heron, who is uh, the Market Access and Food Safety Manager of the Alaska Department of Natural Resources, Division of Agriculture. Uh, and then to my immediate right uh, is uh, Tom Harris, who's currently the CEO of Kanak. Nick uh, Incorporated. And I, I've known Tom for a long time. He's served as the CEO of uh, other native corporations and Alaska Village Initiatives. Um, uh, Kanak Apu is working right now on an LNG uh, plant in the valley with Siemens uh, for, for moving LNG uh, north into interior Alaska. Uh, as past president of Alaska Village Initiatives, uh, Tom helped uh, uh, ABI sponsor the creation of tribal conservation districts to address food security in rural Alaska, and there are now 23 tribal conservation districts in Alaska. Uh, also joining our program is Terry Smith, President of Unified Operations and CFO of Airstrike Firefighters. Terry is a Commonwealth North board member and will be our president next year. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our head table. start by inviting Ed Fogles to the podium. I mentioned Ed recently finished a 30-year career with the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. He ultimately served as the Deputy Commissioner of the Department from 2010 to 2017, where he was responsible for overseeing five divisions, agriculture, forestry, mining, land and water, parks and outdoor re recreation and support services, as well as the Office of Project Management and Permitting. He's currently a partner in Jade North LLC, a consulting firm specializing in natural resource management and Alaska Native issues. Please help me welcome Ed to the podium. Well, thank you, Mead, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks to Commonwealth North for inviting a washed out old bureaucrat up here to, to give you a talk. Um, as Meet said, I just finished kind of a lengthy career with the Department of Natural Resources. I, uh, uh, I was blessed. It was the most amazing career I think anyone could have. I was involved in just about everything that, that the department does. I started a career in land planning where we were developing the state's land use plans for, for how to use state land. So in those plans is how we come to make those first decisions, whether that land should be set aside for public use, disposed of into the private sector, we identified agricultural soils and drew the first maps, the, the classified state lands for, for agriculture, which is, is kind of critical. I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit more later. I also ran the state's land sale program for a number of years, so I'm real familiar with how the state sells land, and in particular, uh, agricultural land. And as Meet said, my last uh, uh, portion of my career was as deputy commissioner. Um, I was overseeing all those divisions that you mentioned, um, and although all those divisions have big issues like mining and water and timber and firefighting, I was passionate about agriculture. That, that bottom line, even though uh, you know, it was a, a smaller of the divisions and some people say maybe not as flashy, I, mean, I, I really enjoyed working on agricultural issues. Um, I have a personal interest. I'm a foodie. Uh, I do all the cooking in our household and I kill to have uh, local foods, as many as possible. So. So I am passionate, even though I'm no longer in government. I, have a, I think I have a good perspective on, on the government side of things, and, and I stand ready to help uh, Commonwealth North should you uh, take on this issue and try and make some progress. Um, I mean, what is food security? I, I, I'm not going to answer that question, but just to point out that it kind of means a lot of different things to a lot of people. I, I was talking to someone this morning uh, 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 from rural Alaska, asked him what he thought, he said, oh, food security, that's simple. That's a marksmanship class. <laughs> um, people have different views on, on food security. Um, in my role, in my work with, with government, it was always hard to kind of compartmentalize 
what you're actually going to work on. Um, is it uh, commercial agriculture? Is it the subsistence needs? Um, as Mead said, we have uh, over two and a half billion dollars that Alaskans, Alaskans spend every year on food, and most of all of that is food from the lower 48. So, so how do we spend more of that money on Alaska produce? That's kind of the, the fundamental one of the fundamental questions. There's also, and that's good for our economy. It's good, good for our farmers. Good for our culture. Um, it's also good for our security. If should, should there be a supply chain interruption uh, down in the lower 48? Uh, you know, and, uh, someone may have some more uh, accurate numbers, but there's always this this number of how many days of food do we have on the shelves if the supply lines get cut off? And, you know, the numbers are, are variable anywhere from six to six days to a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not sure it's worth really uh, parsing that number out, but it's it's not long. We don't have a lot of time once those supply chains get, get cut off. So in my career, I saw a lot of government initiatives that tried to address and coordinate this discussion on food security. Um, Governor Parnell created the Alaska Food Resources Working Group with uh, Administrative Order 265. Um, and that was an attempt to get uh, all the state agencies sitting at the table to talk about what are the obstacles, what's government's role in helping food security and what are we doing wrong what can we what are the obstacles that the state can remove um, that group kind of was spun up shortly before governor walker took office uh, governor walker redirected it uh, to include the subsistence universe uh, the governor parnell's working group really focused on the commercial ag part of it because at that time the thinking was that once you pull in subsistence into the discussion it, it certainly complicates it and makes it a lot more uh, a lot more involved. So the original working group was just focused on commercial ag. Governor Walker uh, made an attempt to broaden that out to a broader, to pull in the subsistence of the, in the rural discussion into that into that uh, process. I, I do not know where that um, that uh, uh, effort has led. If it, if maybe Johanna or Arthur Keyes is here, who's the director of the Division of Agriculture. They may have some more in, intel on that, but. I mean, I think it was a good, uh, a good effort, and there's still more work to be done. The Alaska Food Policy Council, and I know there's uh, a number of board members there, they've done spectacular work over on this issue over the years. They've, uh, they've, they have a strategic plan with a, a series of recommendations. Um, they uh, they have hired some consultants to do some pretty, pretty good reports on Alaska's food situation. Like notably, the Ken Meter report. He did a pretty in-depth report in 2014, and I guess he just followed it up with a, an update in 2018. Um, a lot of good recommendations in, in that report also. Um, I'll mention the, the Inuit Circumpolar Council also did a uh, report on the called the Alaska Inuit Food Security Conceptual Framework, which I think addresses sort of the outer side of the food security issue, the rural, uh, so how do we protect our access to our subsistence resources so, and a lot of good recommendations that, that came out of, uh, out of that report. So, so there's, there's been a lot of uh, government work, and I, I should mention uh, Representative Karen Carr is here, and she spooled up um, a subcommittee within House Resources to address this issue also. So I, uh, I hope that uh, the new leadership in the House will uh, continue, continue that work, because it's definitely worthy. So anyway, again, the fundamental question is why don't we have more Alaska grown produce in grocery stores? And, uh, and I'm not going to be standing up here answering that question other than to say it's, it's complicated. By the way, that was my nickname at DNR. It's Ed. It's complicated, folks. <laughs> Anytime the leadership asks me, how come this is so, I would always respond, well, it's kind of complicated. So in fact, a quick story, I went into a meeting with uh, uh, one of our previous governors and as I walked into the room, his, his staff he said, oh, here comes Ed, it's complicated ogles. <laughs> that is my nickname. Um, but anyway, I mean, I, I go into my local grocery store, which is the Jewel Lake Cars. And right now, there's a lot of potatoes, a lot of carrots. And during the summer, there were other vegetables there. Um, it's good, and, 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 uh, and that's great. But most of the produce in the cars is not the last year. I think everyone knows that. And the reasons for that are complex. There's, there's a long list of reasons. And people for years have been trying to hit all of those reasons and trying to address them and, and up that amount. I think, you know, ultimately we're doing good. I think progress is being made. 
Um, but um, but we still need to do better. We need more Alaska grown up, and we can do it. Um, you say, well, we just don't have enough land, we don't have farms. Well, Ted Meter's report in 2014 came up with some figures that he calculated out, and, and I haven't gone through to, to really verify these, and some of you may dispute them, but he basically said, the land required to produce all of Alaska's demand, this is in 2014, for potatoes, we would need 4,700 acres of land to produce all the potatoes. We would need 200 acres of land in production to produce all of our carrots, 200 acres for all of our cabbage, and 600 acres for all of our lettuce. That totals up to less than 6,000 acres of land. Since 1978, Alaska sold 180,000 acres of land for agricultural purposes, 180,000. Uh, I know 160,000 of that was sold within the first 10 years of, of, of that program, but still. So 180,000 acres has gone out. We currently on the books have about 200,000 acres of land that are classified for agriculture out there on state lands that are available for agricultural disposal. So we do have plenty of land. In some respects, it's out there. Uh, it's way more than is required just to pr produce all of all of those uh, the, the produce that I just mentioned. Um, so the land picture is very complicated. Um, it's not easy. I was talking to uh, to Greg, uh, uh, who's, who's, has his own meat business here earlier, and he said the fundamental problem is it's not affordable. We need larger tracts of land that are more affordable. So. Okay, state law requires us to sell land at fair market value. So when you take a, a thousand acre tract of land and you appraise it for fair market value, it's going to be pretty darn expensive. So over the years, the state's program is to sell only agricultural rights, agricultural covenants, so that will decrease the value of the land. And uh, you know the estimates, and Arthur might be able to uh, correct me on this, but it's about the uh, appraised value of ag only land is about one fifth the cost of the simple land. So, so that's one way the state has tried to get affordable land out uh, in, in, in Alaska over the years. And that comes with its own set of problems that are hampering agriculture. It's very difficult for a farmer to get a loan for a personal residence on land that he does not have to be simple title to. So there's been some governmental discussion of how are there ways we can fix that. And that's an issue that hasn't been solved yet either. Um, also, farmers want to do something else on their land. They may want to supplement their income with bed and breakfast or, or some other business, and that's not allowed if you only have agricultural rights. So, so there's, there, there are a lot of uh, complications with land, and I think um, one of the recommendations that I see that, that everyone keeps talking about, that uh, I think it's underway, and at some point we need to take it to the next level, is do we need to modernize Alaska's uh, land sale program? And uh, you know, Hannah may have some, some discussion on, on how uh, the Division of Agriculture is, is looking at that right now, but I think, I, I know that there's more work that we can, can be done there, and there's more ways that we can come up with to get better land out that's more usable uh, for farmers. So we do have some positives that I've seen. In, in, I mean, we do have good produce in the stores. Uh, the number of farms are increasing. I think Johanna will mention that. Um, we have, we have the, the number of farmers markets keeps increasing. We have like 40 now. And, and apparently that's a big number as far as all the states in the in the nation go. So that's there's there's there is growth. There is growth. Uh, the Division of Ag recently uh, started a, a five dollar a week challenge to challenge every last week to purchase five dollars worth of local grown uh, food every week. Uh, I think that's a fantastic program, and I'm, I'm uh, curious if there's an update on that on, on how that's working. Um, but so so you are making progress. I think if you look at all of the, the entities I just described to you that have been working this issue, all of these reports come out with lists of recommendations. If you look at those, they sort of tend to weave together, and there's a lot of common recommendations. And I think at some point, whether it's Commonwealth North or whether it's the state government, Division of Ag needs to pull everything together and really drive the, the one discussion on how, how we move forward on this. And, um, Take all these recommendations, put them in big piles, sort them out, uh, look for commonalities. I mean, you got common themes. Land is one that I just talked about. Uh, food storage. We can grow a lot of food in our summers, but we have long winters. Uh, a real key is how do we store the food for the winter, whether it's 
food that can be stored fresh, like carrots or potatoes, or whether it's food that has to be processed somehow, uh, glass frozen. Um, that's going to take some infrastructure. And whether the government builds that, or is the private sector funds that, I mean, those are all big questions. I mean, a lot of these recommendations come out and say the state should invest in. The state should invest in. And while that may be true that they should, can we? Um, our budget situation may not allow us to do that anytime in the near future. Um, and we do have obstacles. I think I think the, a government-led initiative should focus on government obstacles. What can government do to remove obstacles? We have high input costs, fuel, fertilizer, transportation, energy. I mean, a gas line would be beautiful. I mean, that could restart Agrium and, and uh, lower the costs of fertilizer in Alaska. We have workforce issues, uh, aging workforce. Uh, young people just don't want to be farmers anymore. In Alaska, I don't know if you can blame them. It's really hard to do to make a living here. So that that really has to be addressed. That's incredibly important. Uh, and uh, so, so we have uh, we have we have the obstacles. Uh, I guess I, I would just encourage the, the new incoming administration um, to, uh, uh, to to take this bull by the horns and. And work with the legislature, Representative Tars subcommittee, and figure out a, a solid plan forward that, that everybody can agree to, and, and have, have measurable tasks, and look at the obstacles, figure out where to kill each and every one of those obstacles. So, again, I thank you for your time, and I'm ready to help the Commonwealth North should decide to push this forward, or anyone else. I said I'm, I'm passionate about this issue, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help out. So, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, Arthur, why don't you just stand for a second so that people know you are. I, I just want to say I've worked with a lot of directors in state government, and I don't think I've ever met a more enthusiastic advocate for his, uh, uh, for, for his division, his mission, and Arthur Keys. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, was Arthur the guy who took me and showed me how those carrots fix more sugar uh, at night? And uh, we got the sweetest carrots in the world, is that right? Yeah. All right, Joanna. Uh, Joanna uh, Heron is the Market Access and Food Safety Manager at the Division of Agriculture and serves as the State Marketing Officer for Alaska. Uh, Joanna also serves on the Alaska Food Policy Council Board and the National Farm to School Network Advisory Board. Her section in the Division of Agriculture includes the Specialty <coughs> Crop Block Grant, Export, Alaska Grown, Food Safety Education, and Farm to School Programs. Please help me welcome you. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to share some of what we're doing at the Division of Agriculture with you all. Um, I want to start by asking all of the Food Policy Council board members to either stand up or raise your hand. There's quite a few in the room. Um, and I just encourage you to, if you have questions or want to follow up with any of the Food Policy Council board members, you have a lot of them, a good handful of really a, lot, a large amount of knowledge in this room. So um, thank you, Ed. I have a, a couple things I want to touch on today. I'm going to talk uh, basically about most of the programs that are under my section, and then um, I will give you a brief update about uh, lands. I, I got an update from that before I came down, and then um, I want to leave you with some ideas on what you can do as individuals and businesses and organizations. Um, so with the lands, I, like I said, we, we've sold 180,000 since um, 78, and there's now 200,000 available to sell, 100 of which is uh, all wrapped up in the Nanana uh, uh, project, um, which is a large amount. So, um, and that's all dependent on, that, on the building of that bridge. Um, in order to get more land classified as agricultural land, uh, we need more soil, soil data. And we're one of the states that have very little soil data because they have to be class four soils where um, that, be, that would be a reason to designate that, that part of land as agricultural land. So there are a couple innovative, exciting things that are happening right now. Um, right now the lands team is working with forestry to get access to ag parcels via uh, roads and section lines that they clear. So there's this nice forestry agriculture uh, partnership that's developing. Um, and then we're also uh, thinking of developing what workshops that can complement an ag land sale after it's sold. So helping people get to that next level of what to do with that ag land once they get it. Um, so that's exciting. And then there's also three parcels that are coming out this fall that are going to be sold in the um, Delta Fairbanks area. 
Um, so the rest of the, the stuff I want to share with you is some programs that the Division of Ag is working on. And I think that um, what you would hear under Director Key's leadership with all of the division is um, that really all of those challenges and opportunities that we're talking about are, or, I'm sorry, challenges and obstacles are just opportunities. Um, I think there's a lot to look forward to and there's a lot we can do with that um, and nowhere to go but up. And so we're really excited about the programs we're running and, um, and where they can lead us to. Um, our team developed a vision this last year, and our vision is that all Alaskans will have access to Alaska grown food and farm products, and that they'll value it and, um, and be purchasing and part of that system. Our vision is that all Alaska producers have a reliable and consistent market. And finally, our vision is that um, all people, organizations, and businesses know their role in that process, because it's going to take everybody to be working together to have, um, have that food security we're looking for in our state. So for the Alaska Grown program, I don't know how many of you know this, um, Alaska Grown, the state branding program, is the second longest standing program in the nation, which is really cool. I think it's Jersey Fresh is the one that's going to And that we're also number four in Facebook following of the state branding program. So we have over 57,000 followers on the program. Um, so that's really, I think we have a presence. I would say that uh, absolutely Alaska Grown is one of the most recognizable log logos in the state. And, uh, and it's, it's finally gaining that momentum and, and recognition that we're excited about. That $5 recommendation, that $5 challenge we've been running has come from the report that the Food Policy Council sponsored. And, uh, and yeah, it asks every Alaskan to spend $5 a, a week on Alaska Grown. And at the end of the year, you would find $188 million coming back to the local economy. Um, and that's, that's exciting. That's a good number. It's a huge number. Do we have enough food in production to meet that at this time? Probably not. Do you know what, what we would have, where it's at? Maybe 20, Maybe 20, what? 20 million. So we have a, a lot of room for growth. <laughs> um, this, uh, this last year was the second year we've run that challenge. Um, the first year, the Car Safeway and Palmer won, and they won with an amazing display. Basically, the idea is that if you go into a retail store, whether they're serving, whether they have Alaska Grown available or not, they don't always make it easy to find. And so we were encouraging retailers to make it easy to find. How do we get it if we want it? Um, and Car Safeway did an amazing display. They did a little farmer's market inside their store. It was really cool. and had this standalone display of all these colors, all of ours. And, um, so they took the, the prize last year. Uh, this year, our prize will be our, our winner is going to be announced soon. So everybody, keep your eye out. Um, we're excited about that. That's coming up. Um, and then we also won an international award this year for um, for the first award we've gotten for marketing, um, and it was uh, through the Naval Organization. It was a marketing excellence award for the five dollar challenge. Looking forward, we're excited. We've already seen it hit a couple other states. New Mexico has just launched their own five dollar challenge. Um, on Monday, I hosted a call with a uh, couple of our partner states in the Western region, Colorado, Montana, Nevada, no, Nevada show up. Um, Hawaii, and New Mexico. And we're talking about working together as a team on states to go to the corporate level and go top down with this and see if we can get buy-in from the corporate uh, level of the retail sector to have them launch their own $5 challenges per state. So we're still teasing that out, but it's something that's kind of exciting and we hope uh, we hope moves forward. A couple other cool things to keep your eye out for. We have a app now. It's Alaska Grown. You can uh, download it. It's Alaska Grown, all one word. And that is where we're going to be putting our new directory. Um, so it'll be the way you can find producers. We're hoping to get a lot of restaurants in there, all kinds of stuff. Um, we're excited about that. And then we also have an amazing website called buyalaskagrown.com. So those are a couple of things going on with that program. Uh, next, I want to just touch on uh, some of the market types that are out there. Um, as Ed mentioned, we've got it's got over 40 farmers markets now. In 2005, it was only 13. So that growth is just tremendous. And and if you go per capita, uh, we do rank in the top 10, I believe, um, for that direct to consumer um, market, which is which is really exciting and something to be proud of. This last summer, we went to 13 markets and collected um, information and data from 900 people. Um, granted, these 13 markets are really small to really big, but if you um, aggregate it, the average customer count was 285 customers per hour, spending about $40 per visit while they were there. And virtually all of them, I would say over over 97%, uh, wait, 97%, right around there, um, heard about the farmer's market either by driving by, word of mouth, or social media, which was really interesting. Um, and over 80% responded that they go there for Alaska Grove to find it. 
The next size market that, uh, that I want to bring to your attention is the farm to school market, that institutional size market. And that's where you're getting into that reliable, consistent sale. And it's not, not direct to consumer anymore, but it's a little bit more wholesale. And that market's really important because it's that scaling up of a producer's um, uh, production that you see that is going to be able to give them that diversification on their business, on their farm, and, um, and really get into a section that is going to be there every year. Um, and what we see is, uh, so Alaska, in Alaska, ASD is actually the largest buying power of food in the state, which is, it, it's just insane and crazy. And so um, we have been working for years with ASD. There's been a couple state investments in the past in Farm to School, and one of them has led to a lot of good relations, actually both of them, um, have built some really strong relationships between school food buyers and producers. So um, what we're seeing right now, ASD has actually just invested in, um, in a bunch of equipment that will help them with peeling potatoes and chopping root vegetables, um, which is gonna contribute, it's just gonna be a game changer, I think, for those the products they end up getting to incorporate into their, their menus. And this is all complemented with the education of kids, with you know basically leaving our youth that are the next consumers, they're the next farmers, they're the next leaders, with this taste in their mouth of understanding and appreciating and knowing why it's important to value global food. So all of that work that we're doing is really exciting. Right now we're just doing it federally with, uh, with grants and stuff, but I think, uh, I think that the path that we've gone down with the history of it has really led to some strong, strong outcomes. Um, finally, I'm gonna leave you with the export market, which has gotta be a part of this as well. Um, in the export world, right now we have uh, the candy industry that's really our biggest industry that's, um, that's exporting. And um, when you think of our market in Alaska, we're really all spread out and it's kind of a small market. And so um, something like the flower industry, where it's just one window, is gonna have to take advantage of other things. Um, what I hope is that at some point our barges that are coming up full will leave full. Um, that's kind of a, a goal in my mind. Um, so we're excited that we've been able to partner uh, lately with some of our other states. Uh, next year, we're hoping to have two uh, trade missions. We've done an export survey now and we had 44 people respond to it, and that was a partnership with Maine, Alaska. And so um, I think with uh, the two of us working together, we'll be able to find the businesses that are taking advantage of Alaska agriculture and hopefully um, some value in the peony industry and be able to get our, our uh, stamp onto that export world market area. So what can you do? Um, as individuals, everybody can go out and look, ask, and buy. It's really simple. You're gonna go into your restaurants, you're gonna go into your stores, and you're gonna see what's in front of you, know what your bounty is in the state, and you're gonna ask, is this from Alaska? Um, and then you want to, to purchase it, to support it. Um, did we have any greens today that were grown from any indoor hydroponic places? If not, why not? Um, the businesses and organizations, what can you do? You can start to think about ways that you can incorporate and integrate, make it a part of your mission and plan to increase what you're, what you're actually serving to the public with, um, with the, the theme of closer, fresher, better. Very simple, right? Um, in Alaska, we have less pests than anyone else. It's closer, it's fresher, the quality's there, it's sweeter, it's just a top-notch product, and it's gonna help build that food security um, that we're looking for. So thank you for asking me to come and share some of the, the stuff that we're doing at the division, and um, I look forward to hearing how this, how this turns out. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Tom Harris to the program. Tom, you taught me, and I hope you uh, help this crowd understand how saving one mama moose is like a permanent fund for uh, for a community. And uh, I know you've got a lot of other places to speak about too. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to visit. I'm here as a surrogate for Charles Parker. Charles is. Uh, the president and CEO of my successor at Alaska Village Initiatives. Alaska Village Initiatives is a community enterprise development corporation that actually predates ANGSA, and it was the template for the creation of all of ANGSA corporations. Um, the community development corporation was created by President Johnson under the war on poverty, and the issue there was to reach out and find solutions for rural America as well as urban America on food security. There's not food security. There is no community. And now that our communities are centered in cities, 
55% of our population lives in cities. And that happened in our lifetime. We are told by 2030 that number may reach 60%. So the demand for food security is going to grow worldwide. And rural Amer America's solution cannot be found in the city. It must be found in, in our own hands in the decisions we make. Uh, thanks to corporations, you may, some of you may know that there was a provision called 7i. And that 7i is a particular process that distinguishes us from uh, tribes under World 48 or any other organization. And it is called an interdependent organization. That means we feed each other, care for each other. 70% of the profits that are made, a harvest of timber or oil or gas or coal, it's shared with all the other corporations so that we grow together. And that sharing process is a, an ancient lesson. I have ancestry indeed in, in southeast Alaska as a Clinton and a member of the Tongass tribe, which the Tongass National Forest was. But I also have ancestry with a fellow named Richard Harris, who is formerly the partner of Joe Juno in creation of the city of Juno. Uh, and as a result of that, I have um, part of my culture is English and Scottish and Irish. So I'm a member of the tribe of Ish. <laughs> How many Ish tribal members here? Very good. Do you know where the name Ish comes from? If I were to introduce myself, I would, in, in the traditional Tlingit way, I'd say, Achishas, Achas, Achsanihas. The beginning of that is Achishas. Ach is my. Coincidentally, it's also, in Tlingit, it's also my in German. Ish. That comes from the eldest male. The very oldest male. Shah. He's a married man, Isha. Coincidentally, that's the Hebrew name for Adam. So we, we count ourselves as ancient relatives. And in doing so, it's my obligation to speak to you not in a dependent manner, not in an independent manner, but in an interdependent way. Very much like that seven eye sharing that we talked about for the next corporation to create with. And if I can be interdependent in food, what else matters? And if we can't feed our children, wherever they are, what else matters? I have some information and I'm very pleased to have this invitation to speak with you in Commonwealth because that's another name for being interdependent, isn't it? Commonwealth. To share not only our resources, but our decision-making process, our understanding. As a member of the uh, tribe of Ish, I recognize the fellow named Robin Hood. And Robin Hood was more likely more than just one person. As, a, as the history goes, it was, may have been several people over the years. But we all know about the Magna Carta and that was a phenomenal document, foundation of our Constitution. But there was another companion document called the Charter of the Forest. And the Charter of the Forest was absolutely critical. The Magna Carta was written for the nobility. The Charter of the Forest was for the common man. And the Charter of the Forest is where we get our concept of habeas corpus. It is also, and the reason for that was to guarantee the right of the free man to feed him and his family from the forest, to gather food from the forest for his animals, to gather firewood. And it was the king's forest. Now, as Americans, there is an Ameri another American out there that has access to more wildlife habitat than we do. Yet, would it be, surprise you? that no habitat in America has such a low harvest rate as ours. When Hammond was in office, 
Kenai Peninsula documented a moose harvest over 2,000 moose. The last harvest I saw of the Kenai Peninsula was 66 moose. Do we know that? Should we know that? Because we didn't lose that many hunters. Those hunters went elsewhere. During Hammond's time in office, the Yakutat community had over 500 moose harvested. The last documentation I saw was less than 50. And it's a management style. Now we're here talking about agriculture. Why am I talking about wildlife? In an interdependent society, wildlife is agriculture. And these language connections that I've told you about are more than 5,000 years old. They're more than 10,000 years old. They're more than 20,000 years old. As a child, growing up in Ketchikan, I learned the name of a village underwater. And I learned it from my grandmother. And she shared with me where that village was, what went on there, the name of it, and why it was important to us. And she pointed it to a, a map, and there was nothing but blue on the maps, because we didn't know anything about the country. We just knew that, OK, from here to here, right there, Grandma says there's an underwater village. Well, she passes on, and I'm at Lubbock Christian College learning about business and agriculture there in Texas. And I get homesick, and I go look at a map. And lo and behold, the first bathymetry. So again, there's an underwater mountain just where Grandma said it was. Probably just a coincidence. We now all can look on Google Earth and see that under mountain underwater mountain, and we can see the inlet she talked about. But that's still a myth until somebody says otherwise. Well, as it happens, the Haidas are our first cousins, and they had the same myth. In 2014, scientists went down and found the village site. They found a site from agricultural practices. Those sites are there today, and they say the last time that site was above water was 13,800 years ago. Just think how many mothers, grandmothers, and great grandmothers, and great grandchildren had to carry that message on so I and I just would know that message. And that message was food security. We owe it to the grandmas. Guys, I made a terrible discovery, and I'm sure it's going to hurt you dearly. But do you know hair is really memory sticks, and I'm losing mind? <laughs> and I'm real worried about some of you in this room. <laughs> and that memory security and food security are in our matriarchs. That's why we're made for our culture. That's why she says, go out and get food for the children. Grandmother was a dead shot, so she could get all the food she wanted. But at the same time, the point being here is we have, a, in this state as a policy, should have not identified wildlife as part of agriculture. It may surprise you to know that we're the only state in the nation that doesn't. It is a USDA identifies wildlife as an agricultural issue. And there is a $7 billion pot of money available to the private landowner to help that private landowner deal with wildlife and promote wildlife on private property. For me, as ancestry of both cultures, I think Alaska made a mistake when we stopped at land claims for Alaska Natives. There should have been land claims for everybody here. Just think what a difference it would have made if we had done that. We would be like the other states and going after this bit of money together. And, and we need to correct that. I'm the CEO of the Nanks Corporation. I've uh, spent my career in that field. At any given point in time, I've managed as much as 300,000 acres. Yet I can't give you a lease to manage that property for agricultural purposes because of the policies in the state. I've had individuals outside come in and ask, uh, let me 
use this program from USDA. I'm sorry, I can't let you do that because we'd be in violation of state law. But I can do it in Virginia. I can do it in other places. As we've documented this issue, we've documented that in 2004, I'm going to hold up this salt. Assume this is a pound of salt. I want you to take what I say with a pound of salt. Okay? Not a pinch. In 2004, it was documented that more wildlife was harvested within 50 miles of Washington, D.C. than was harvested in all of Alaska. And this is hoofed wildlife. That wasn't always the case. We know that. We are, in 2004, it was also documented that Alaska was the least productive wildlife state in the nation. And the policy issue that it focused on is whether or not the state of Alaska acknowledged agriculture and wildlife as companions, completing interest, not competing interest. And we would encourage the Commonwealth interdependently to look at these when we know that based on the work that's done already by Alaska Village Initiatives, 500 acres managed for the village for food security would feed and provide food security for a village of 500 people. We have 44 million. We'd be happy to enter into arrangements with you to get that land more productive. Anxious as completing interest, not competing interest. As part of the competing interest process, it's important for me to say that if I said anything to offend you, I apologize. It was not my intention to offend. It was my intention to open the door for conversations. We've been trying to have this conversation for a long time. When these numbers first came out, we did share them. And it was difficult. Uh, some of you may know me as uh, someone who was involved in a moose altercation with a, a local fishing game officer and made the press. And I was charged, was supposed to be charged with a, a fine uh, for interfering with moose. And it's that, and when we went back to our interdependent humor and said, we need help, we need to have this conversation. And if it means us getting arrested, then we will offer the moose salute. Do you know what the moose salute is? <laughs> Thank you for laughing. And thank you for laughing at my terrible jokes. We're going to go a, a bit long today, but we've got, we, this is a great kickoff. And Tom, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, it's a great kickoff to a discussion that we're going to continue. I'm going to ask Terry Smith to come to the podium. He's CFO for Airstrike Firefighters, an Anchorage headquartered company. They're standing up a fleet of converted P-3 sub-hunter aircraft out of McClellan, California to provide large air tanker fire suppression to combat wildfires across the U.S. Uh, in this context, he's also president, CEO, and founder of Unified Operations. In 2016, Terry started researching infrastructure investment needs to help boost Alaska agriculture opportunities. He partnered in 2017 with a local poultry cooperative to test the costs and demand for fresh Alaska poultry. They also launched Bogard Food Hub to provide farmers with cold storage and aggregation services to help them reach hotel, uh, help them reach wholesale markets. And prior to founding Unified Operations, Terry was CFO and corporate treasurer for Carlisle Transportation Systems, a trucking and logistics company offering complete supply chain solutions across the U.S. and Canada with over 800 employees. Help me welcome Terry to the public. Well, thank you, Mead, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today as we kick off this, uh, uh, this, this topic that really, uh, I think, has been underserved uh, by, uh, by many. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, two years ago, when I started looking at investment opportunities in the Valley and, and uh, around Anchorage, I was struck by the uh, amount of, uh, of uh, interest in starting the entrepreneurial opportunities for uh, the small farmer and the people talking about poultry and, and, and pork production and, and of course then McKinley Meats uh, ran into its issues and 
Um, and uh, thankfully, we've got a, uh, a good steward that has taken over that uh, infrastructure and has, uh, has uh, 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 stabilized the, uh, that aspect of the production cycle from the growth and our growers to get it into market. And uh, so we appreciate that greatly. Thank you very much. Um, but what, I want to make just a couple of quick comments. Um, the job of and our mission at Commonwealth North is to illuminate and educate Alaskans. And one of the ways that we do that is we bring the best minds that we can find in the state to tackle very complex issues, whether it be health care, whether it be the permanent fund, whether it be fiscal sustainability. And, and, um, and what we're talking about today is, is um, is one of the most complex items that we could discuss because of all the things we've heard today. And so I guess what I want to do is take my time and just say, hey, folks, um, we appreciate you for coming out today to talk about uh, uh, public policy uh, uh, requirements that are going to need to be tackled in this complex issue of food security. And um, this last two years of my efforts to build out this uh, food hub and some of the poultry processing uh, uh, capacities in the valley have taught me a lot about um, the network or lack thereof of the uh, growers in the state of Alaska and also the costs. So all these barriers to production that really we need to come together and deliver on some of these 7i uh, solutions so that we can collectively uh, help not only grow jobs in Alaska, but also our food security. So thank you uh, as the president-elect for Commonwealth North for coming out. Um, if you're not a member, please join, and um, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Terry, thank you. Um, one of the fast questions that was asked is, how much of the food are we eating today was uh, Alaskan grown? And the answer is, all the veggies in today's salad and uh, uh, on the meal were, uh, were Alaska grown, as, as I was made to understand. Am I correct on that, Jim? Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was a pretty good poultry, too, so uh, we'll, see. we'll see about next time. Uh, a card has been set up that says the Alaska Food Policy Council offers our resources to this Commonwealth North effort. This includes research expertise and policy recommendations to help improve our food system. Uh, also, there's an upcoming conference in March in Homer. And then uh, they wanted people to be aware that uh, the former Alaska Native Hospital site on 3rd Avenue is currently being used as a demonstration urban farm. Uh, we have a whole slew of questions, and what I thought I was going to do is just read the questions and then pass the mic uh, to each of the panelists for concluding comments. And if there's a part of the question you want to answer, we can, we can do it that way. Um, this will be a continuing effort. I think if uh, Terry and I have anything to do with it, and, and, and we do, and, you know, I, I especially I want to thank all of you for being here, but I will just say this. Tom, you know, the notion that, that uh, we are not harvesting anywhere near our wildlife capability uh, is tied to agriculture and food security uh, and land planning issues in a couple of different ways. And one of the concepts that's come up is that you could designate an area for regeneration uh, of wood-fired energy in a village that by cutting it and regrowing it actually creates more moose browns near the, near the village. I know that some of you here have worked on that concept. And uh, there, there are many ways to increase agriculture and increase wildlife uh, production at the same time. So here are the questions. One is we need more soil data, yet the only soil labs are part of the university system and the lab at the UAF experiment farm was closed due to budget cuts. We seem to be working against ourselves. Please explain why. Another question is too many children are going hungry in our state. How will food development help us combat this critical issue? Another question, please discuss the future potential of Alaskan aquaculture. Uh, what is more vulnerable to disruption? A question we ask, fuel, i.e. gas, diesel, heating oil, uh, uh, heating fuel, or food? And does the panel know which will last longer? Uh, do you suppose reaching out to groups such as NASA, SpaceX, and other space tech groups could help? The rationale is that if you can grow it and store it in Alaska, then doing so on Mars is easy. We just watched uh, the Martian uh, watch, watch him try to grow potatoes uh, just the other day. 
Uh, please comment on work done regarding a value-added facility for locally produced food, and this is in addition to simple food storage. Uh, another question that close to my heart, because I chaired the Aerospace States Association, uh, there's a great opportunity to develop drone UAV uh, technology right, in assisting agriculture here in Alaska. Please discuss. And the last one, in addition to outdoor agriculture, indoor growing is increasingly a promising option. Is, uh, is the Division of Ag also working on overseeing the opportunities for indoor food production? Are there opportunities for ag loans and state support? And then, uh, I, I actually missed on uh, one of the questions, oh, uh, cards here, uh, in terms of export crops, barley, sugar beets, pork, reindeer, beef, uh, farm, farm fish, peonies, Brussels sprouts, hemp, uh, uh, and, uh, and our fertilizer industry, how does that all fit into the agricultural picture? So I'm gonna pass the mic uh, to, for, for concluding comments. And if you want to answer a question that's been said, uh, Johanna, I know you've got the answers to some of them. And uh, 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 we'll, we'll go from there. But uh, there's plenty to work on on this study group. That was a lot of questions, and I don't know that I have a lot of good answers. Um, and I think it was too many too fast. So what I would say is that um, value-added facilities, I think right now we see a lot of people doing it on their own. We see, we do have a couple processors in the in Anchorage area, and then I think the central kitchens are, are stepping up the school central kitchen facilities, which are large facilities. So um, value-added has uh, so much opportunity, though, and I think that is a, a key to the export question. Um, they all fit in because uh, the more wins we have, the more we can diversify the businesses and um, success of our producers, the more um, that we're going to see the food security come full circle. So uh, Bambino's Baby Food uses local agricultural products in her uh, value-added baby food. Um, so manufacturing has a lot of opportunity and all of those other uh, platforms that you can, you can find that will, um, that will be something that is export ready um, and, and hopefully see those barges and planes leave the state full. Um, I think what I heard thematically over and over is that there's a lot of uh, value in partners and there's tons of partners to go around and we have a different system up here with our structure for the state, um, but it doesn't mean there's not opportunity to partner better together like mariculture, aquaculture, all of those things and wildlife and fishing game. Um, indoor uh, closed environment farming, yes, absolutely, it's on the rise. Um, we funded a couple projects looking at the nutritional differences between that and outdoor. Um, I think there's nothing but opportunity with that. And we do have grants and loans at the division. We um, run the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program as well as Agricultural Development Loan Funds. So both of those are great funding sources for agriculture. I think that's all I have. Thank you again for inviting us. Uh, one of the things that we would like you to think about is the next time you cut into a piece of bread meat, that piece of red meat in the local store likely is not has not been frozen. But in rural Alaska, in the community, for example, of Yakutat, where they get flights two times a day, one northbound, one southbound, that pound of meat is frozen, and it's $27 a pound. That means the local moose out there is worth $10,000 to a local family. And when that local family doesn't have that, they become dependent. And if they become too dependent, then the next stop for them is the streets of Anchorage or one of our jails. We can fix that. There ought to be no reason why this land can't feed everybody. And it is a process that we have to get out of the independent silo thinking into working with each other Sure. And believe me, I, I, we've got 9,000 acres in the valley. We'd love some, for someone to come forward and say, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll make that land available to, to grow. And as we've talked about, the harvest of wood that he's talking about is the regrowing willows. I don't know if you, any of you have been between a bush of, of, of willows and a pregnant moose. It, it's a losing proposition. You might as well get out of the way. And they're going to run for miles to find that willow so they can have a healthy camp. And with the right willows, they'll twin. And by the way, staying that close to that village will mean that the predators will stay away. And 
Well, that cat needs is eight weeks, and it's ready to outrun a bear. These are easy issues that, that, that we've learned from many resources. I look forward to your <coughs> discussions on this, if we can contribute in any way. We have decades of information to share. We are looking for the right ground to share it in and do it in a safe, sane way that uh, we can feel comfortable about having that conversation. Ms. Sheese, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I, I may take a crack at a couple of questions, if I may. I, I uh, noticed a question on aquaculture. Um, just a quick comment. Um, as, I, as I was leaving DNR, uh, it was really clear that the number of land use applications for submerged land for, for, for our aquatic farming were increasing. So I think that there's a positive story there, that, uh, that that's, a, that's, a, that's a potential big industry. There were some government obstacles and, and how to regulate that, how to how to cut that land loose that need to be addressed, but, but there's, there's a real positive future for aquaculture in Alaska, in my opinion. Um, there was a question about drones and more research for, uh, for agriculture. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in my career, too, is that the University of Alaska um, can do more research that's specific to agriculture and helping the ag industry, and when you ask them why they don't do more, their answer is, well, the grant money's not there. So I believe that there is a uh, state role in driving research priorities. I think the state could come up with a very strong, clear research priorities list uh, specific to agriculture that would help channel research dollars into agriculture. So I think that's a good thing to put on the to-do to list. As an example, I have a friend that's, uh, um, he's building a malt house in Walla Walla, Washington. He's, he's getting malt grains from farmers and he's gonna malt them and sell them to local brewers and distillers. That's not really food security, although beer is one of the, the critical food groups, right? So if we have a supply chain interruption, most all of the, 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 the beer and alcohol brewed and distilled in Alaska uses grains from outside Alaska, so that stops, and we don't want that to stop. So um, my friend is working with the University of Alaska Fairbanks to talk about uh, doing some research into grain varieties that might grow up here that are, are, are specifically good for malting. So so research team, um, needs to be uh, addressed. Um, and finally, we've mentioned it, I think Johanna mentioned it a bit, but I just want to close by, um, by sharing my excitement about the Nanana uh project. And there, there are some of the best ag lands in Alaska are right across the Nanana River from the town of Nanana. Um, they're pretty inaccessible right now uh, all season because there's no bridge there. The bridge is actually partially built. It's, uh, it needs to be finished. There's some permitting obstacles. But that's a huge, huge potential project. There's not only ag, some of the best ag soils in Alaska there. You've got incredible timber resources. There's oil and gas resources there. So that's, that's very exciting. That will happen. There will be this, there will, that bridge should get built in the next few years. And this is an, a, a place where we can all look at how we've sold and divided up ag lands in the past find out what works, what hasn't, and if we want to change and modernize something, here's our opportunity to do to do it really well. So a potentially a very exciting project. Thank you. Thank you. One question that was not answered is about the uh, University uh, Soil Labs. Uh, do you know why that was closed? Uh, was that a budget issue? Or? Oh, and probably budget issues. I mean, a lot of the cooperative extension services were also I sit on the, the, the university's uh, state committee on research, which you and I have sat on, is meeting tomorrow. So I'll take that card with you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you again for being here uh, today and the uh, Food Policy Council uh, for, for your offer to help. Uh, I'm sure we will hear more about this. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panel. Coming up on uh, December, and uh, on December 12th, Commonwealth North will host our 12th annual Legislator Meet and Greet Luncheon. It's again at the Denina Center, and each year we invite the incoming Senate President and Speaker of the House to keynote the program, to present their legislative priorities for the next legislative session, and then in several rounds of table discussions, you had the opportunity to meet with individual legislators to discuss public policy issues. 
This is not a campaign event. It's not a political debate. It's not a cross-examination. It's an opportunity for well-informed, thoughtful Alaskans to discuss key issues facing our state. So please register on our website and join us for the SIGA Gulf North program. Uh, I'd like to thank Greg Wolf for being here today at the World Trade Center for helping to publicize this program. Greg, uh, you do a huge amount in this community to help bring this community together, and we can't do good things unless we get together. Uh, last year, we produced the commemorative map you see in the back of the room. Please take a look. It's Banner White. I'm sorry, Jim Egan is uh, <laughs> passing that uh, and, and pointing to it. Uh, and let Jim or Aaron know if you'd like to purchase one or several on your way out. And, uh, uh, we're coming up, uh, you know, this was made for the uh, anniversary of the uh, of the Alaska Purchase. We're also coming up on the 60th anniversary of Alaska becoming a state. That's uh, January 3rd, uh, uh, 2019. And, uh, uh, you know, we may figure out a way to have a champagne and a bonfire. We'll let you know about that. Thank you all for joining us today. And I encourage you to become a member of Commonwealth North. Pick up a membership packet at the registration desk.